praise the Lord, church. Let's all stand this morning and give God some praise. Hallelujah. Is he worthy? Hallelujah. Let's lift his name this morning. Lord, you're so good, Lord.
I get excited when I think about greater things. I mean, I've had great things in my life, but to think that there's greater things coming, it makes me so excited. And to see what God's going to do in spite of whatever circumstance we're in, I'm so thankful that we can expect greater things with God. Amen. Time. Thank you for joining us. We're glad you're here today. It's such an exciting time to be a part of the kingdom of God. There's revival everywhere. It doesn't look like it may have looked 40, 50 years ago, but God's spirit is moving and he's doing great things across this country and across our world. And I'm excited about what God's doing. I'm so excited. We had a wonderful prayer meeting last night. The power of God and presence was here. Hearts were being stirred and changed and touched again. I'm so thankful that we had the opportunity to join together. And today, you know, we're celebrating our 23rd anniversary. And I just... <laughs> it's been an incredible 23-year journey for me. Um, we, I've learned a lot from my husband and... I'm sure he's learned a lot from me. <laughs> but we do love each other very much. And <laughs> we started out as best friends, which is always the best way to go because then when you have, uh, what do they call marriage moments? <laughs> or uh, what did he call it? Um, what did Bishop call it? The um, intense fellowship <laughs> moments then you can come back and, and still have that, that bond. And I'm so thankful for him. And one of the things that I've learned over the last 23 years is how to live by faith. He has exampled it, and he has proven to me how God works, and he has helped me, encouraged me to learn to trust in God, even when I don't see how it's going to happen. And one of the things, you know, I think I got, would get so impatient because I wanted it to happen right now. I, I wanted that need to be supplied right now. Or I wanted that answer to come right now. And I would try to make decisions on my own or, you know, take us in a direction or do something that I thought was best instead of just waiting for God. And if I would have waited for God, his blessings probably would have been a lot better than what I had in plan for us. But I'm just so thankful that I have learned over the years it doesn't matter. I remember one time, I'm going to share this story. Um, when the kids were all little, I was a stay-at-home mom, and it just was a very, very stressful time. And it was very tight financially, as most young families feel, that tightness. And I remember <laughs> it was just something so trivial and so small that the vacuum cleaner fell backwards, and it knocked out a whole window. <laughs> But I remember how devastating that was to me because I just felt like it was just one more thing. I had to find the money to replace. You know, it was one more obstacle, one more trial, and it just was, just was kind of like a breaking point for me. But it, during that time, we received a financial blessing that was unexpected. And it was just one of those foundational moments when God used those kinds of things to teach me that I could trust him. So I don't know what you're facing today. I don't know what obstacle is in your path, what mountain is in your way. It may be a molehill to other people, but it's a mountain to you. I don't know what you're facing, but I just want to remind you today that God is faithful. And his mercies are new every morning. And he is there. He is ready to supply. We just have to trust him and let him do the work. And all you have to do is finish the race. You don't have to be the fastest or the strongest. Ecclesiastes says it's not the race is not given to the swift or the strong. It's just we know it's given to the one who just finishes. So just hang on, keep holding on, keep trusting God, keep believing, and let him lead and guide you today. God bless you. We love you. Amen. And uh, it truly has been a journey. It's been an awesome experience. And I'm just so thankful for the woman of God that she is. And I'm thankful for her life, her investment in, um, in my life and in our family. I'm so truly, truly thankful for her consistency, her walk in relationship with God. And um, she has a way, and I think God does this on purpose, 
at times, especially for pastors' wives or ministers' wives. God gives her all the good stuff. God gives her all the great, incredible thoughts and leaves me with the leftovers. And I'm just so thankful for a wife that when she reads the Word of God, God speaks to her through that Word, and she can speak that into my life. And it's evident uh, multiple times I've preached messages, and different ones have come up to me and said, your wife write that message? And it's, it is so true. She's such a tremendous lady, is such a tremendous woman of God. Most of all, as she said about us, uh, we're best friends, and I'm so thankful for my best friend today. I'm so thankful for Holly. It's been an amazing 23 years, and I look forward um, to another at least 23 more, right? And so that's, we're just getting started. And somebody told me the other day when I was bragging, I was bragging about 23 years. I said, isn't that incredible? And they were like, that's nothing. I'm like, what? It is something. They were like, no, I've been married, you know, 115 years or whatever it was. It was a long time. But I thought, man, you know what? But it truly is, especially in today's time and day that we're living in. So I celebrate not only my wife and our marriage and our relationship, but I celebrate each of you today, whether you're going on your first year of marriage or your 117th year of marriage, whatever it is, we celebrate you today and we're so thrilled and honored that you've joined us today into our online campus. We especially welcome you. Thank you for the honor and the privilege. You see, these have come today um, into the Lord's house, right? They've come into the worship center to hear a word from God, but you've actually brought us into your living room. And so we thank you so much for trusting us to come into your home today. And we're praying for you, and we're praying that God's blessings remain on you through this time, through this season that we're in, that we're all walking in right now. It's a difficult time. It's a troublesome time. But I'm so thankful that we serve a God that is faithful from beginning to end. He is faithful at all points in between. He's an incredible God. And I love him today and so thrilled that you're here. We do want to open up with prayer today and ask the Lord to move and to minister in a powerful way. And as I look across the congregation today, many of you we have been praying for uh, throughout the week. And uh, you're here by divine appointment. God has designed this service, this experience for you today. And we're so thrilled that you've joined us on this Sunday morning. We do want to pray and ask God to continue to move and minister in Bruce's life, Bruce Bullock, that healing would flow through his body. I better not get into a whole list here because we have so many requests, so many needs. But we're just asking you right now, would you just join together and pray with us? And if you've got a special need in your life and you know the person next to you, or maybe you don't know them, but you feel comfortable just sharing that with them, just lean over to them and say, hey, listen, I need you to pray about such and such, this situation in my life. And we're going to go to the Lord in prayer right now. Would you just join us today? Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for your great grace. We thank you for your tender mercies, God. We thank you for the privilege, the opportunity that we have to come into your presence to worship you, to lift up your name, God, to praise you, to understand this is a great honor, it's a great privilege to be in your presence, and we thank you for that. And I'm asking you in Jesus' name, in the name that is above every name, in the name of Jesus, the name to which every sickness, every disease will bow, in Jesus' name I pray right now for healing, for strength, for recovery, renewing, I pray for restoration, God. I pray for complete and total healing in our bodies right now, healing in our nation, healing in our world, God. We desperately need you in this hour, especially, God, in this moment of time, in this season that we're in. We call on you right now, not out of desperation, God, but out of determination to hear from heaven, God, to receive a response by faith in Jesus' name. We believe, God, for you to work, for you to move in a powerful way. And I pray that you would encourage your people this morning. Lift them up, Lord. And I pray as the singing goes forth and as the word comes in just a few moments, I pray that you would speak to hearts and lives, that you would touch us this morning. Do a work in our life today. We praise you. We give you glory and we give you honor. In Jesus' name, come on, put your hands together and give God some praise. He's worthy. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. 
And before we give you an opportunity to give, and those of you that are members online, uh, are members of our church, and those that are watching online, you know you can give online, you can text to give, and we just thank you for doing that. And as you're preparing to do that, if you normally do it on Sunday morning, um, we thank you for that. But one, one thing I just want to encourage you, we're, we're doing our best, and I want you to listen to me closely especially those that attend this church on a weekly basis. We're doing everything we can to keep these doors open. We are wanting to make sure that we can have church here. I don't want there to be an outbreak. I don't want there to be, I don't want there to be uh, an issue. I don't, I, we just don't want to do that. We don't want to get set back three or four, six weeks, right? So I'm asking you to follow the guidelines. We don't make you wear a mask when you come in, but we're strongly encouraging you to. We're strongly encouraging you to wear a mask. Unless there is a physical medical statement from your doctor, we're encouraging you to wear a mask. It is so critical. It's so necessary. You say, Pastor Jay, I've done my research. I've, I've done this, and I've watched this, and I've, I've done. That's great. I'm not asking you to do it to protect yourself. If you don't care whether you get sick or not, do it for others, right? Because there is studies that show that it, it can reduce the exposure if you're wearing one and you're in contact with someone else. Those are strong words, and I know we have guests. There's never an opportune time to say something like that. So I, I hope and trust that you'll receive it well. It's one of those jobs that was, that was not listed in the pastoral job description, I guarantee you. To get up and have an, a pleasant, you know, um, little conversation with a church congregation. But I've seen too many churches. I have too many friends that have been exposed to this thing. And I'm just asking you, please show, um, show some consideration for others. Wear the mask if you're able to do that. I understand if you just cannot, you hyperventilate or whatever the case may be. I get that. But if you have the ability to wear that, I'm asking you to do that. Use our hand sanitizer stations. Practice social distancing when you're here in the worship center. You know, if you want to stand around and talk, do that outside, right? So that there's fresh air blowing. We just want to minimize the risk. And I know that we struggle not just in all ages, but specifically we struggle with our younger groups, right? So we're spiking right now in, in, our, in our state, 18 to 29, I believe, is the age right now that we're seeing a great spike. So I'm asking you to be considerate, and I'm asking you to do everything within your power to follow these guidelines, right? I don't get up and I don't hammer on this. I don't harp on this. I hate to have to say this right before I preach get you all stirred up against me. But I'm asking you to do this for the sake of others. And I truly, truly, truly appreciate your support. And I thank you so that we can keep these doors open. I don't want to have to worship from home. I want to be able to do it together. And it's just a small thing that we ask. So God bless you. Thank you so much. We love you. You've been walking the same old road for miles and miles. If you've been hearing the same old voice tell the same old lies. If you're trying to fill the same old holes inside, there's a better life. There's a better life. If you've got pain, he's a pain taker. If you feel lost, he's a way maker. If you need freedom, a saving, he's a prison shaking savior. You got chains, he's a chain breaker. We've all searched for the light of day in the day. Found ourselves worn out by the same old 
Somebody testify. You believe it. You receive it. If you can feel it, somebody testify. Testify. If you believe it. If you receive it. If you can feel it, somebody testify. him a little bit. God, I love you, Jesus. God, I'm coming to this place.
feel the Holy Ghost in this place. He's here. Woo! In the name of Jesus, Lord, we praise you today. We thank you that you're before us, you're behind us, you're always right beside us. Thank you, God, that you bless us, that you keep us our going out and our coming in. When we rise up, when we sit down, we're reminded your word is with us, God, your power, your presence is with us, and we thank you, we praise you today, God, and we give you glory. Thank you for this worship team today, God. Thank you. I pray you would refresh them, renew them, revive them for pouring themselves out this morning. And I pray right now as we go into your word, the anointing of God would rest upon every ear to hear, every heart to receive, God, every mind to comprehend what the Spirit and Word would say. I pray, Lord, that revelation would come, and I pray a release would come. In the name of Jesus, let there be a release. In Jesus' name, we thank you, we give you praise, we give you glory, and we give you honor. Come on, somebody say amen. (laughs) Woo! Aren't you glad to be in church this morning? Amen. God bless you. You can be seated in Jesus' name. I want to turn your attention to Psalm 56. And while you're turning there, um, I just want to say how much my family and I appreciate the men that came out yesterday and blessed us in our home. And uh, thank you. You know who you are. You know what you did. And we appreciate that so very, very much. Um, Just feel overwhelmed with gratitude. So thank you so much for that. It was a huge blessing to our family. Psalm 56. Psalm 56. I want to draw one passage of Scripture, just one verse of Scripture as you turn with me there this morning. It says, Thou tellest my wanderings. Put thou my tears into thy bottle. And then he makes the statement, Are they not in thy book? Put my tears into into your bottle. The story is told of an angel that that came down to the earth. He was sent, and he was given orders to bring back the most prized, the most treasured, precious thing that he could find on earth. And so he descended from the heavens. He flew down, and he searched from pole to pole. He went to the depths of the sea, and he picked up a gold nugget, but he thought that it was not good enough for a king. It was not worthy of a king's attention. The angel, um, he, he descended and he found a flawless pearl. But even that, he didn't feel was good enough for a king. So the angel kept searching, kept searching through and through. And finally, he heard a sob. He heard someone crying. And it was a man, as the story goes, on his knees, pouring out his heart to God for help and forgiveness. And the angel said this. He said to himself, ah, that's it. I have finally found the most treasured thing. The angel held his hand under the man's face, and he caught one of the tears that were flowing down his face. And he flew in triumph back to heaven. And he stood presenting the tear to the Father, proclaiming that the tear is the most precious thing on earth. The truth of the matter is we see tears being shed so often that we forget just how precious they are. But tears have meaning. Tears cannot speak, but they, they, they cannot talk, but they speak volumes. Job said it this way in Job chapter 16, verses 19 through 20. He said that also now, behold, my witness is in heaven. My witness is in heaven and my record is on high. My friends scorn me, but mine eye poureth out tears unto God. This is what Job is saying. He is telling us that tears that flow from the face of a person may be overlooked by others, but each one is cataloged and collected by heaven. You could say tears are a language that God truly understands. Washington Irving once said that there is a sacredness in tears. They're not the mark of weakness, but of power. 
They speak of eloquently, more eloquently than uh, 10,000 tongues, I believe he said. And they are the messengers of overwhelming grief, of deep contrition, and of unspeakable love. The psalmist David referred to a bottle for tears. A bottle for tears. He said, my tears are in your bottle. They are bottled up. They are recorded in your book. And it was not until I traveled to Israel that I discovered the ancient practice of tear bottles. In the Latin language, they are called lacrimatories. Lacrimatories. And in the Roman world, many of them were made out of glass. I have something that is uh, just, it's just a type. It's not an actual tear bottle. It's probably a test tube. But anyway, today it's going to be a lacrimatory, right? It's going to be a tear bottle, a tear catcher. But it was usually a simple vessel-like creation with an opening at the top of its long neck that someone placed to their cheeks to catch the falling tears from their eyes. And it was normal at funeral processions uh, in Roman times for friends to bring along their lacrimatory and weep their tears, catching them in these miniature delicate bottles and then place them at the graveside as a token of their sorrow for a departed one. It was common for the wives of Roman soldiers to collect their tears and then bring the brimming tear bottle to their husband upon his return as a token of their love and devotion. Some of you are thankful we no longer do that. <laughs> I'm sorry, that was wrong. Lacrimatory soon became companions to people in grief, and, and they would take solace in the fact that their tears were not lost. However, here's the interesting point David is making. Notice again, God is the one holding the bottle to your cheek, and it is God who is collecting your tears. He has a lacrimatory just for your tears, a bottle, a vial. In other words, what David means is this. God has not missed one tear that you've ever shed. Tears of sorrow, he's collected them. Tears of repentance, he's got those too. Tears of frustration, tears of confusion, tears of fear, tears of hurt, tears of rejection. God is so deeply interested in your troubles and your trials and your tears that he is cataloging and collecting and keeping all of them in a protected place that only he has access to, and that is the lacrimatory of heaven. I'd like to title my message this morning, The Last Lacrimatory. The Last Lacrimatory, and I rarely do this. In fact, I don't know that I've done this but one other time in my entire ministry, but I would like to dedicate this message today to David Wiltshire and Bruce Hemphill, two of the most tender-hearted men that I know. The truth is, tears never fascinated me until I met a person who could not cry. I met a woman in life that could not cry. She would laugh at the rest of us and with the rest of us at something so humorous that her stomach would hurt and yet her eyes never grew moist. She could experience excruciating pain and yet never shed a tear. As it turned out, she was born without tear glands and therefore without the ability to cry. You see, with the eyes, if your eyes get irritated or if you're feeling sad or um, you're feeling extremely glad, tear production ramps up. And the tear gland or the lacrimal gland, which sits above on the outside of each eye, secretes water until your eyes fill up. And you'll see somebody that's on the verge of crying, and you'll know what we're talking about. You can see that watery, that watery glaze that kind of comes over there, and then you see it puddles right there at that lower lid until it finally, with one blink, the dam is broken loose and tears begin to flow down the eye. Each eye can hold about seven microliters of fluid. When this threshold has been reached, 
And when it's been crossed and the dam has broken, tears begin to dribble out of your eyes and down, or out your eyes and down your cheeks. And excess tears can also flood the drainage ducts that lead to the nasal passage and hence the runny nose that often accompanies crying. In studying and preparing for this message, my research discovered that there are three types of tears. There are basal tears. Basal tears are the body's way of lubricating, moisturizing, and nurturing and protecting your cornea. Then the second type is reflex tears. We're more familiar, perhaps, with these tears. They're produced when your eyes need to wash something harmful, like an irritant, like dust or pollen, smoke or foreign objects, or even an onion as you're slicing it and the fumes rise up and cause your eyes to water. But then the third type is a unique type of tears, and it's the emotional tears. Emotional tears are caused by extreme emotion, doesn't have to be sadness, it could be happiness. Even intense humor can cause your eyes to water up. Humans are the only mammals known to produce tears as part of an emotional response, such as out of joy or grief. What is interesting to me is biological research has shown that tears of emotion are chemically different from tears caused by intrusions into the eyes. Emotional tears contain higher concentrations of stress hormones, one of which, listen to me, one of which is a natural painkiller. So in a sense, in a sense, God uses tears, which are a result of pain, to heal pain. I'm a crier by nature. That's what I do. I, I have a tendency to cry. I, I have always been this way. And I know the two men that I spoke of earlier, and I know that they're touched oftentimes emotionally to the point of tears, and that's why I'm dedicating this to them because I can relate to that. I have always been moved by the condition of others. I cannot watch a documentary on war without being moved to tears at the loss of life. I cannot even pick out a card for my wife without tearing up in the aisle. I still weep at the Christmas story. I can't even listen to a message, and I'm thankful for this. I am so thankful for this, but I cannot listen to a message on Christ and the crucifixion without being moved emotionally to the point of tears. And may God never heal me of that. I always want to be touched and stirred at the thought of one who gave everything willingly before he ever knew me. I watched you last night as you ministered to the hurting and the hungry, and I was moved to tears. Listen to me, risking being misunderstood and spoken ill about. I did not step in because there comes a point where the church needs to feel the weight of a soul, and you need to experience afresh what it means to weep for the lost. It is not the pastor's responsibility to feel that weight alone. It is my responsibility to transition to you and help you move to another level where it's not about us. It's all about them. And some point or another, it has to move us to a point. It transforms our figure. One of the greatest tragedies of the church is if we lose our vision for others and our burden for souls. The shortest verse in the Bible in John chapter 11 verse 35 gives us deep insight into the heart, the burden, and the compassion of Christ. It simply says, Jesus wept. If you have never memorized a verse in your life, this is your starting point. You can, everybody can do this. Jesus wept. But oh, the depths of revelation that come from that one two-word passage of Scripture to think that the one and only true God was moved by the thought of others. 
Understand in the passage of Scripture in John chapter 11, he was moved to tears because of Lazarus, because Lazarus passed. And I'm going to come back and we'll, we'll finish up where we left off, but just hang with me for just a second. He was moved with compassion because Lazarus, his friend, had died. But never did a tear leave his eye until he arrived on the scene and he saw someone else being moved. He saw someone else stirred. He saw the burden that they were carrying and they did not have the hope that he had. And he said, this troubles me. This stirs me. This moves me because I don't want them to walk through life shedding tears and not having hope. But let me step into somebody's world today and help you understand if you came in crying the Lord is weeping with you because he feels what you feel he carries that burden we have not a high priest that cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmity He's a God who feels. He understands what it's like to be in pain and suffer and to have discomfort in his body. He knows rejection. He understands what it means to have so-called friends walk out on his life and even curse him within earshot. Don't you understand this morning that whatever you're going through, whatever it is that you're battling in your life, it moves, my Lord, to tears to think that you are carrying this with the thought that you are carrying it alone. There's a heavenly hand this morning that is reaching toward your tear-laden face, and he is saying, hey, I'll take that. Let me capture that moment. Let me handle that hurt. Let me, let me take and, 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 and get a hold of that pain that you're feeling in your life. The reason he wept is found in verse 33. He wept and he was troubled when he saw Martha and the mourners weeping. But look again with me to Psalm 56. Psalm 56, here the psalmist David is writing a poem about being surrounded by difficult and even life-threatening circumstances. And David writes this in verse 1. He said, Be merciful unto me, O God, for man would swallow me up. They would devour me. They would eat my lunch. They would desire to put me down and to take me out. They would swallow me up. And every day they fight to oppress me. But then he goes on, verse 2, Mine enemies would daily swallow me up, for they are many that fight against me, O thou most high. But then look at verse 3. Notice in verse 3, he said, What time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. What time, I love the realism of that admission that David made in this particular psalms in other words he said I am outnumbered I may not make it out of this alive and I've got to confess something to you as mighty as I am and it doesn't matter how many lions I've slayed, how many, how many bears I've torn, you know, and I've killed. It doesn't matter how many giants I have slaughtered. I am at a point in my life where I'm going through something I've never been through before. And I've got to tell you that I am afraid. I'm worried. I'm concerned. I'm afraid. My heart is broken within me. I'm stirred within me because those that I thought were on my side are against me now. But if you skip down, if you skip down in verse 4, he adds this, In God I will praise his word. In God I have put my trust. I will not fear what flesh can do unto me. Notice where he put his faith. He put his praise in God. In God I did this. In God I did that. And because I stayed in God, I can say assuredly today that I have put my trust and I will put my faith in him. Listen, you just stay put in God. Don't walk out. Don't leave. Don't, don't separate yourself from the presence of God. Stay where God has planted you and grow in him. In God I will praise and I will give thanks. Whew. I can imagine him clenching his teeth, standing with his face to fear and saying, 
I shall not. I will not be afraid. I am, but I'm not going to be. I'm struggling with it, but it's not, it's not going to get the best of me. I may have my moments where I doubt God, but I'm not going to stay in doubt. I'm going to move forward in him. What David is effectively teaching us through his, his experience is that faith does not eliminate fear. It does not eliminate fear. In fact, faith is perhaps most clearly seen when you can act in faith while in the midst of fearful circumstances. Trust does not eliminate trouble. Who trusts God more, the one who trusts him when the sun is out or the one who trusts him when it's dark and the fog of circumstances hides our eyes from the shoreline of our destiny? Which one trusts God more? I stand before you to tell you today that even in your darkest hour, if you will lift your eyes, you will maintain your faith, you will maintain your trust, you will come out of this, but get your eyes on Jesus and stay where you are in him. Evidently, it is possible for fear and faith to occupy the mind at the same time. Faith does not mean the absence of fear. Faith means moving forward in the face of fear. Fear is the thing that calls faith out of us. The obstacle that's too big for us, the situation that we cannot fix, the sickness that we cannot cure, these are the things in life that bring faith, uh, bring fear to the surface and cause us and prompt us and push us to try our faith in God. But if we look behind those fears, we will find faith is hot on their heels. You just keep praying, you keep believing God, even in the spite of fear. You keep your eyes focused, you keep your mind clear, and you just keep pointed in the right direction. You may be staring fear in the face right now, but faith is coming along and will attack in a position and in a place fear cannot defend. While fear is staring at you, faith has got his eyes locked in on that fear. In the name of Jesus, God hath not given us a spirit of fear but of power and of love and of a sound mind I present to you today that every fear is an opportunity to have faith in God's power faith comes before the miracle proof comes after the miracle so we pray for faith and then we wait for proof we pray and we wait for proof Fear is actually a kind of faith. I know I'm probably tingling some of your theology here this morning, but listen to me. Fear is actually a kind of faith. It's faith in the wrong thing. But it's still faith. It's faith in something that is not even there, but it's still faith. It's faith in the wrong thing, the bad thing, the worst thing. And we succumb to fear when we forget that God is still there with us and in us and for us. Listen, I thank God for times that fear drives us to faith and trust. I thank God it's part of what's kept me saved over the years. Struggling in my unbelief, struggling with my faith, struggling with my fear. It prompts us, it pushes us, it drives us to get closer to God, to seek Him more. It's the troublesome times of life. We're guilty of saying there will be no tears in heaven. I've been guilty of saying the same thing. And yet one of the promises of heaven means more to me now than ever before. Revelation 21 and 4 said, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There shall be no more death. There'll be no more sorrow. There'll be no more crying. Neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. We've been promised that God is going to pop the top on that final lacrimatory. And he's going to place it to our eyes and collect that final tear. And in that moment, in that moment when the last lacrimatory is placed to our face, somewhere between the transition of earth and heaven, 
God's going to take that last sampling of sorrow from our eyes. When we step foot into heaven, I believe the same finger of God that wrote on the, on the stone tablets the law and the love of God. I believe that same finger is going to be used to wipe every tear from our eye. There'll be no more tears in heaven. There'll be no more pain, no more suffering. But listen to me. The same word, and I think Sarah Legron, I can't see it because I got my glasses off, but I think Sarah Legron highlighted a scripture in her Bible reading this week in Colossians where it says the handwriting of ordinances, the King James Version, I think she was using, referencing the New Living Translation, but the King James says, and having, the, um, having blotted out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, took them out of the way, nailing them to his cross, that word blotted out is the same word that is used in Revelation 21 and 4 where God says, I'm going to blot out, I'm going to wipe all your tears. I'm going to take care. of When we say that God blots out our transgressions, what do we mean? We mean that God is going to remove our sin from us. There's not a devil that can read our accusation again. There's not, a, there's not a spirit that can come against us and bring up the past that has been forgiven. Why? Because God has blotted out those things so that no one else can read them. When God blots your tears, when God takes his finger and he blots, there is no more crying. There is no more tears. There is no more worry because you will be in a place of, in, of purity no more impurities to affect your sight. I'm telling you this morning, somewhere between here and there, that final collection is going to be made. And I believe God's going to step in and do something powerful in our life because some of us have been going through pain and been struggling with things. Our final tear will not be shed down here, but our final tears will be collected after we have arrived in heaven. Tears of sorrow and tears of suffering, tears of sadness and loss and pain, none of those anymore. Lacrimatories will be a thing of the past. No more need for those things. God holds the last lacrimatory in his hand. You can stop collecting the pain. You can stop collecting the bitterness. You can stop collecting the hurt. Just give it over to God. He's got a record of it all. He's got a record of it all. I want you to think about something. There will come a day when we will never hurt, we will never fear, we will never sin, we will never hate, we will never lose a loved one, we will never worry, we'll never have hurt feelings. Aren't you looking forward to that day? We'll never hear an unkind word. We'll never hear about war. We'll never have to go see a doctor. We'll never receive bad news again. We'll never be touched by cancer. We'll never have to make funeral arrangements. We will never have to wait on an answer to our prayers. There's coming a day. There's coming a day when God's going to hold the last lacrimatory in his hand. And he's going to say, they're all mine now. Don't you worry about them any longer. I'm blotting that out of your life. Heaven wouldn't be heaven if we had painful memories. Heaven wouldn't be heaven if we had a sorrowful sunset. Heaven wouldn't be heaven if we had the things of our past attached to our face. There's an old song by Dottie Rambo and those... <laughs> I'm kind of revealing my age a little bit. I remember my mom and dad playing Dottie Rambo songs and there's an old song I had to go back and find it it's been so many years since I've heard this song but the words to the song go like this if I could count all the tears that have fallen they would seem like an ocean to me and if my heart were a window that you could look through all the pain and scars you would see but tears will never stay the streets of the city not that city no wreaths of death on my mansion door teardrops aren't welcome beyond the gates of glory she said 
because the heart will never break anymore. I've never met one man without sorrow. She said, never looked into the eyes without pain. But there's a land where death has no victory. I said, but there's a land. There's a place that he's prepared. There's a mansion he's built. I've got a reservation this morning. And there is a land where death has no victory. And the songs of joy are the only songs they sing. We're told by the psalmist that weeping may endure for a night. Come on, somebody say it. Weeping may endure for a night, but... Come on, struggles may endure for a night, but... Oh, I may have some pain in the midnight hour, but... I may be struggling in my marriage and my relationship right now, but... Oh, I may see my children falling apart, but... I may be struggling to make ends meet right now, but... I may be battling sickness in my body, but I may not see things turn out the way I want to see them right now, but I may be in the darkest night of my life, but but John come at the morning. I wish somebody right now would just stand to your feet and declare joy in the house. Come on, I'm not weeping because I'm sad. I'm weeping because there's coming a day when I won't have to shed a tear. There's coming a day when I won't have to hang my head in sorrow. There's coming a day when I'll never feel another ache or another pain or another cramp in my stomach. There's coming a day. <laughs> The last lacrimatory. It's not in our hand. It's not in our hand. No, on this morning. We're just giving it to him. There may be a time and a season that you'll go through and maybe you're there now. Or you're going to question God. Maybe you're questioning Him now. Listen to me. Don't focus so much on what you've collected. Take solace in the fact His lacrimatory is much greater than yours. And there's not one drop that has fallen from your face that he has not already sampled and taken a collection of. Those tears that you've cried when no one else is around, they're in his bottle. Uh, well, some of you are going through things in your life right now you've never been through in your life. You've just never been through this. You've never walked this way before. That's okay. I'm praying for you right now in the name of Jesus that the peace, the power, and the presence of the Lord would overshadow your life. In Jesus' name, I pray for those online and I pray for those in this building right now. And I pray the power of your presence would overshadow all of us. God, we need your grace. There's tears we've wept that we thought they were in solitude. We thought no one else saw those tears, God. The pillow has long since dried, but you've kept them in your lacrimatory, God. And somewhere in a vault in heaven, you've got a collection of all of our pain and all of our sorrows. One of these days, one of these days, 
there's going to be a pouring out. I find it interesting that the one person in Scripture who washed the Lord's feet washed them with her tears. I don't know that she fully realized what she was doing. But can you imagine how heaven came to a standstill when vials started being filled with the tears of a woman that others felt was unworthy? Father, I pray right now in Jesus' name that you would move and minister to every hearer, every viewer right now. Let there be a healing. Let there be a restoring. Let there be a renewing. In the name of Jesus, let there be a release. God, they tell us that something happens in our body when we release our tears. Toxins are released from our body. Excess of hormones are released. Chemicals release in our body that are excessive, that cause depression and cause other things in our life. You've given us the ability through tears to self-heal. I pray a release in this house right now as we weep in your presence. Let there be a release, God, of toxins. Let there be a release of pain. Let there be a release of sorrow. Let there be a release of struggle, God. Let there be a release of bitterness, God. Let there be a release, Lord, of things that have troubled our life. I pray this in Jesus' name. Let healing come right now. We want to give you just a few moments, those that are watching online, those that are in this building. Thank you for joining us today. We love you. We're praying for you. If you need us, reach out. Contact our church office. Email us. Just reach out to us. God bless you. We love you so much church as you would just pray spend a few moments in prayer yes God